We're ready to go. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday, October 20th, 2021 meeting of the Northampton Community Preservation Committee. Uh, as always, we begin with general public comment. Is there, are there any folks out there we're not seeing who wish to speak on general issues relating to the CPC? Doesn't seem like it. So we will move quickly on to the approval of the July 7th, 2021 minutes, which Sarah sent us uh, this afternoon. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Linda. A second? Somebody with a second? second. Yep, second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on those minutes? Okay, all those in, uh, Sarah, you'd need to do a roll, a roll call for us on this. Do a well. quick roll call. Um, okay, Brian? Quick roll call, yes. Chris? Chris, you're muted. Sorry, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, Jana? Yes. Julia? Yes. And Linda? Yes. All right, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, this will be a fairly lengthy meeting tonight. We're only allowed to discuss events in between Red Sox innings. Uh, so if it goes on for four or five hours, that's not, not our fault. A uh, few things to report in the chair's, chair's report. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Linda, for uh, two weeks ago guiding us through the approval for the Lathrop Invasive Species Removal Project. Um, Second of all, our meeting schedule is such that we have divided the applicants in half, five meeting with us this evening. And then we are off our usual meeting schedule, We're gonna be meeting on the 27th, which is next Wednesday, and then also on the third. So we have three meetings in a row, uh, the 20th and the 27th meeting with applicants. The third will be public comments and then it will not be until the 17th that we begin our deliberations. So hopefully folks have that in their, in their calendars. Um, just a couple of things when I was looking over our membership, uh, Julia, it looks like you need to contact the Recreation Commission to make sure that you're uh, re-upping your term. So if you're able to do that, that would be great. I think everybody else is pretty good to go. Jeff isn't here, he needs to do the same, but we can contact him at, at another date. Um, we got the financial uh, report from Sarah. Was that this afternoon? Was that some other time? So it's uh, really pretty shocking to look at what we have available to us uh, to the tune of uh, just about 2.2 million, that's million dollars. And certainly in my tenure at the, at the CPC, I've never seen anything like this. So it's really, it's really pretty amazing, very, very exciting. Um, and that is, of course, 2.2 million for not just this round, but the second round as well, taking us through fiscal year 22 in through uh, the end of June of next year. Uh, so that's, that's really pretty amazing. The set-asides are a little over 228,000 for each of our three set-asides, open space, historic uh, preservation, and affordable housing. And then the rest, of course, is undesignated. Um, so that's, that's, that's really pretty cool to see that much, that much money out there. Do people have questions for Sarah? about the finances or about our, uh, anything that she sent today? Are we good to go on that? I actually do real quick. Uh, Chris, un unmute. Sorry, I thought I did. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, anyhow. Um, so Sarah, I, um, I don't have it in front of me, but I did a, a cheat sheet similar to the one you did with the, um, uh, the total, uh, requests for each um, proposal. 
and uh, our percentage, et cetera. And I have a, uh, I, and I left it on the printer, so of course I don't have it in front of me, um, but I have a different number than you did for um, uh, housing the disabled homeless, our request number. I had, I had a higher number than that. Is that yeah. something? So okay. the smaller request was contained in the answers to CPC members' questions. Got it. Okay, that must have so just missed. So that. that's updated since okay. the application. Okay. Great. Thank you. The sure. the initial uh, independent housing solutions request was, uh, um, I think it was nine hundred fifty-two thousand, yeah. and now is coming at six hundred eight thousand. I believe they are uh, hopeful about funding from. Uh, DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development. So we will have to inquire about that when we meet with them next week, whether or not that difference is being made up by DHCD or not. But it's a substantial, what is that? 300, uh, just about $350,000 uh, lowering of the ask. Um, any other questions for Sarah? Good to go. And we can go into this in detail before um, the committee begins their funding recommendations. And if anybody has any questions or wants to see any of this in a different format, I have financial information at ad nauseum, but this seems to be the most useful, concise way to present it. So, but if you want to see any of the, the background information, just let me know. So it is interesting to see that the total CPA requests for this round come in a little over 1.2 million. So if we were to fully fund all requests, we would still have close to a million left for round two, which again, looking at Jana here, I mean, this is stunning. This is just not something that we are used to or know what to do with. So it's, uh, it's exciting times for our, for our committee. Could I ask a yeah. question actually? Is there a, a, a pattern in um, applications where you tend to see more or fewer in the fall versus the spring, or is it just kind of whatever comes in whenever it comes? Uh, it seems to be that most of them have come in in the fall, but that's not always the case. I think that that's probably just a coincidence. Um, this year, we most likely can expect some significant large requests in the spring. Um, with the Resilience Hub and some other projects that are happening around the city. You see those large requests coming from the city or from other entities as well? Uh, a few from the city and potentially some from uh, other applicants as well. Okay, that's good to know. In our, and in our and on that, are we going to get a sneak peek um, before we go into funding for this round on what some of those might be? Are you Yes. Will you bring, will you bring yes. your crystal ball and let us know what the order of magnitude yes. on those is going to be? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you, Sarah. Any other questions for Sarah? Okay. So we have uh, five of our applicants uh, on tap to present to us tonight. Uh, first will be the farmland, the Grow Food Project, Farmland Reclamation Rehabilitation. And then I think that we had, if we follow Sarah's list, three from the city, the open space acquisitions, the Connecticut River Greenway project, the accessible trails at the golf course, Rocky Hill uh, trails. And then last would be the more mortgage subsidy uh, program. Uh, Sarah, is, does it make sense to keep to that schedule, those five in that order? Yeah, I think so. I did distribute the agenda to applicants and let them know of the order. Okay, great. Uh, so um, uh, Michael and Donna, just remember that we have had a chance to review your proposal. Hopefully we've all read it. We've had a chance to ask you questions of which you responded and we read the answers to that. Um, so your presentation uh, um, can be what it is, but do know that we have that, hopefully have that background knowledge. Also, Michael and Donna, please be aware that on November the 3rd, Wednesday at this time in a Zoom meeting, uh, we encourage you to rally your folks and, and uh, um, encourage them to attend to have public comments. It's very valuable for us to hear what people have to say about your projects um, that 
factors heavily into our decision making. So again, that's November the 3rd at, uh, at, at seven o'clock. Um, Michael, you are up first with the Grow Food Northampton project. Fantastic. Should I just take it away? Please. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michael Skillicorn. I'm the Associate Director at Grow Food Northampton. And um, yeah, curious to see you know, what, to, what to present on, I guess, based on what you were saying, Brian, that you guys have seen the application. I do have some, um, like a little slideshow with some pictures, some of that you've seen and some that you haven't to kind of further demonstrate where we're going to do the project and look at maps and so forth. So I'd be happy to show that if you'd like. Um, this is our first time, at least especially in my tenure, applying for CPA funding. So we were a little unsure of how to go about it and what was appropriate and what wasn't. So I appreciate Sarah's help in navigating the process a little bit and um, yeah, just happy to be here to talk about our project. So. I guess a little bit of background, Grow Food Northampton was founded now 11 years ago, and in large part by working with the city um, to preserve a large tract of farmland in Florence on Meadow Street and Spring Street. So we currently own 121 acres, which is preserved for agricultural use. Um, and nestled among it is the recreation fields on Meadow Street and city land along the Mill River. So there's quite an intimate relationship between the city and the rec department and the conservation commission and um, Grow Food Northampton and sort of stewarding land together on that, that large parcel. Um, so we have um, in the past year really renewed our focus on being better land stewards after you know we sort of finished our first decade and done a heck of a lot and really um, built up a lot of our programs off of the farm and expanded the community garden on the farm and the farm lessees that we have. And uh, we took a, took a look around and thought about our next 10 years and um, really decided that kind of refocusing on the farm is, is a great next phase for us. So we've been working with some consultants over the past year and dedicating more staff capacity to it. And one of the important pieces is how do we become better land stewards in the physical sense? So how do we tend to our field edges? How do we combat invasives? Um, how do we protect from flooding um, in the riparian zone? So this project that we applied for is sort of a part of a larger vision. Um, to, to clean up our act bed and take care of our farm as best we can and make it more accessible and educational for the public. Um, so we have a lot of people that interact with the farm, especially the community garden. There's 320 plots and over 400 families that garden there. We do a lot of education with the Northampton Public Schools and you know, COVID messed us up a bit, but uh, especially pre-COVID, we did field trips with K through three classes in the whole district would come down to the farm and visit Crimson and Clover and take a tour in the fall and visit the community garden in the spring. Um, we also do public workshops at the garden and the farm. So really our intention is to make it a public space and an educational space. Um, and in order to do that, we feel like we need to be good stewards in order to educate about good stewardship. So, sort of two parts of, of our proposal here. And one is on what we call the East Field, which is where Corticelli Street dead ends into Meadow Street across that, across Meadow Street, go down a little access road and it opens up into a field that I think in total is probably 25 or so acres. And we own 13 of them. And there's a private landowner on the far side that owns another 13 or so. Um, and the field edge there, so the, there's the river and the city owns uh, a good chunk of it and then it becomes our field. And the field edge has been encroached upon over the years um, by a number of plant species. And so what we're hoping to do is with a one-time project, get in there and, and clear back towards the property boundary um, and then maintain sort of a mode or a managed field edge 
um, so that the field can maintain its, its shape and size and grow more food. Um, and then on the community garden side, there's a couple of little notches that go up and hit Spring Street and there's private houses on either side. And those have become really grown up with different invasives and a lot of bittersweet and other things choking it out. So we wanna reclaim that as well. And we would be able to expand community garden plots or plant some kind of perennial uh, food forest that would be open to the public. So fruit trees and brambles like raspberries and so forth that people could come in and pick, pick your own essentially. So open to gardeners, but also open to the public. Um, so that's the, that's the gist of it. And um, I guess having read the proposal, I wonder if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns that I can address, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, Michael, you said you had a couple of images you could show us, uh, some of which sure. are new are new to us. Could you? Yeah, let's welcome see if to I'm, do that. If I'm able to share my screen, looks like I am. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, I would have been doing this. Oops, I would have been doing this the, uh, the whole time. But so here's a map that you guys have seen, and just to orient, the two yellow spots on the bottom are at the community garden. And then the yellow line at the top is the border of the East Field. And here's Meadow Street down across the middle and Spring Street on the left. Um, so this is one you haven't seen, just to show you what the community garden looks like from above. Um, and I, lo I love pictures like this in this picture because you can, people just garden in so many different ways. You know, there's spirals and shapes and lines and whatnot. And this thing on the bottom right is what we call the giving garden, which is a third of an acre that we grow for a uh, number of different vegetables for donation to pantries and meal sites like manna. Um, so up above, you can see the two houses with the flat roofs. So on the left, in between those two houses, behind the second one there on the left, and then to the left of it is the, the site in question um, for remediation um, here on the community garden parcel. And please jump in if you have any questions, but I'll keep moving if not. Um, and then here's it from the, from the ground level, which I think you've seen this picture. And then here's just a snapshot of the, a Google map of the East Field site. So we're talking about the left border, the west border of this field. And this is kind of what we're looking at, kind of taking this stuff down. There's some tiny trees, small trees that have grown up, maybe two, two inches, three inches in diameter at the most. And then a lot of bittersweet growing up and other vines and shrubs and so forth. Um, so this is all area that could be farmed um, and certainly managed to, to keep it from encroaching again. Um, I think you guys have probably seen this too, just another view of it all the way down the field. And I think that's it. Thank you, Michael. Questions for Michael? Jana? Hi, um, I'm just wondering if you've had any communication with the abutters, particularly those two houses where are your property sort of in between, are there invasives on their property? Do you see that as sort of um, creating difficulties for you maintaining this in the future? Um, so if you could just speak towards your conversations with them. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we know one of the owners of the house um, was recently purchased and renovated and, and rented out um, and have spoken to him about it. And in both cases, both of the houses, the, the lots are very small and they have fences and lawn on the inside. So they have actually no vegetation whatsoever. Um, so I don't think that would be an issue in terms of it spreading again. Um, and actually, in the case of the East Field, one of the reasons that I'm here is because we met with Peter Gazillo, who's the landowner on the far side of the field, and he's taken great care into managing his field edges and um, sort of inspired us to do the same. Um, so that would be a collaborative effort. Other questions for Michael? Um, 
Michael, we funded a lot of uh, invasives removal work over the last few years, and all of them are multi-year projects. This is just a, a, a one and done. You intend once fields are cleared or edges are, are, are um, mowed or cut to replace that with community garden plots, one, and then two, this edible forest landscape. Or, uh, what if invasives uh, make their vicious, horrible attempt to reclaim area? Uh, how will that be managed? Yeah, good question. Um, I should have mentioned that um, on other parts of our farm, we have quite large stands of knotweed. Um, knotweed is not present on the parcels that we're talking about here. So the, the invasives are uh, less aggressive and less pernicious on, on the parcels that we're speaking about here um, than they are in other parts and we're dealing with that separately. So in the case of the East Field, that land will be farmed and then a, a small strip mode on the edge. Um, and if the annual agriculture will main, maintain itself in a sense and keep the invasives at bay. Um, so I feel very comfortable about that. And um, especially seeing what Peter Gazilla has done, just mowing the edge, he's really maintained it and the invasives don't creep in anymore. On the community garden side, that will require more hands-on maintenance from us. And um, we have the benefit of requiring all community gardeners, all 400 families to do community service hours with us. Um, and so we will offer that, like maintaining those, those teeth, we call them in between those houses there as part of community service hours. So we've had some success with that in the past. We've had a small patch of knotweed in the back of the garden. And there's been a group of gardeners that every single week they go and they pluck that knotweed and they plant over it. And they've had a lot of success over the years. So for us, it's, it's, a, it's a question of this one-time investment and then um, turning our attention to it on a regular basis moving forward. And we're really committed to doing that. Thank you, Michael. Other questions? Yeah, I got one. Chris? Uh, Michael, thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, I, I looked at the proposal and I didn't see any mention. Um, it looks to me like it's a, a, it's a mechanical removal of, of, of the foliage. I didn't see any mention of herbicides or anything of that type, but um, would you just clarify that for me? Yeah, so the, the plan is 100% mechanical. Um, and I think in, in part that it will be successful because there is no knotweed in particular. Right. Um, and because of the maintenance that we're planning to do. So we, you know, we got the quote from Wagner Wood, who seems like has a lot of experience in this. And that was his suggestion um, and his recommendation. So there's no plan for chemicals in the, in the near term here. Great, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, you're muted, Brian. You're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, feel free to stick around for the rest of the meeting if you'd like uh, or not. Uh, and also feel free to ask uh, some of your supporters to attend the November 3rd public hearing that we have. Got it, great. Well, thank you guys so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Okay, moving right along. Uh, Wayne, are you with us? Yes, there you are. So Wayne, we have three of the proposals uh, up for you. The order we have them is the open space acquisitions, the Connecticut Greenway accessible walkway project, and then the Rocky Hill uh, Trail. So um, if you wanna stick to those or however you wanna do it. Sure, uh, thank okay. You. Is, is it okay if I share slides? Please. Um, all right, so let me show this to you. So let me just walk you through, I wanna walk you through them all quickly and then obviously available for any questions that you have. So um, as you know, and, and CPA has been extremely generous in the past, we've been building various conservation areas. Um, one of the large conservation areas that we're building is the Mineral Hills Greenway 
it's sort of an aspirational name. It's all the land we own on the West Hampton town line from Williamsburg all the way down to East Hampton. So it's not all connected, but we're trying to get them connected. On this view, the green, this lime green, that's the land that we either already own for conservation or that DPW owns for conservation or that is protected by conservation restrictions. So we're, you know, some shade of green in this map is public ownership or public protection. You can see going to West Hampton. Um, Joan Serafin, who recently retired as the city's assessor, owns a significant amount of land that straddles the Northampton, West Hampton line. And we're working in a partnership with Division of, of Fisheries and Wildlife, Castro Land Trust and the city to preserve a lot of Jones holdings. So the land that she owns in West Hampton, we're not party to this, except it's part of the same transaction. That's gonna to go to the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife um, or one of it, its agencies, so state land to be protected. The land along the road, that's not before you tonight, but just to give you a context, Kestrel's working on, can they do a green cemetery, a place where people can get buried without being full of chemicals? And if that doesn't work, they might be looking for agriculture preservation restriction. Um, so again, that's not before you today. The part that's before you is this area that's brown. So it's landlocked from Northampton, except Joan had access from West Hampton, and we have access because we own the Mill River Greenway, and we have access to the Mill River Greenway from an old county road. So this parcel of land, uh, it's 20 acres of land. We haven't surveyed it yet, so the acreage may change a little bit based on when we do the survey, but that would round off the, the Mill River, Mineral Hills Greenway, and in particular, this brook you see through here, that's called Marble Brook, and it is, I think, easily the most pristine brook in Northampton. So a really important ecological resource, and we're trying to buy land along the brook, both for recreation purposes and for um, conservation purposes. So that's the first one. Um, I'll just, Brian, if it's okay, I'll just keep going, but stop me if you want. So, the second open space parcel on this, again, different, looks a little different. On this area, this is all the Parsons Brook Greenway, substantial um, holding, some land over here, which we've owned for maybe 15 years, and then, you know, pre CPA, and then we purchased with CPA support the rest of this property a few years ago, and we had donations of some land over here as part of a marijuana growing facility that's been licensed here. What's be, so again, we own right along the brook and all this parcel of land over here. Um, this, this doesn't show up because the photo is older, but this is now a solar field. It's owned by Consolidated Edison out of New York. This property is privately owned and we're looking at buying a portion of it, just sort of from the stream over, so five acres. Um, so there's sort of a zoom in of it here. So we're looking at sort of to the center line of the brook and going over here. Again, we own all this land on this one, this land photo taken before the solar was there, but this is now Con Ed piece. So a lot, you know, we, we measure open space often by frontage on a river, you know, amazing amount of frontage of the river used for fishermen and, and used for people to um, just wander around and look. We actually own an easement over here already. So someday we're trying to, connect them, but by itself, it's, it's an important parcel of land. Um, and then the final one is this, the Salma Hills, and the Salma Hills, and so like right here at the bottom of the screen, that's Parsons Brook. So where my cursor is right now, that's the land I was just talking about in the last slide. Salma Hills is again, aspirational, there's still some gaps, but it's the land we're trying to acquire from, um, Route six from, um, uh, well, I guess from Park Hill Road all the way up to basically the Williamsburg town line. Um, the green is what we own already. Um, and the parcel in question is this parcel right here, all owned by the same owner. We're planning to carve out his house. So on this one, you see, we're gonna carve out his house in three acres and we're gonna get the back land. 
Um, backland's really valuable. Right now, you could walk through here, but in fact, the best trail happens to cut this corner here. Um, and so we get to add both ecologically and for pedestrian, you know, from for a user standpoint. So those are the open space ones. Um, again, I'll get I'll keep going, but interrupt me if you want, but I'll go through them all and then stop the other applications. So uh, then uh, yeah. Wayne, maybe it's useful if people have comments on the on the open space acquisitions while it's fresh okay. in our head. Uh, questions for Wayne about those three parcels? Linda? Wayne, I wonder if you could just go back to the mineral hills and and talk about the surrounding property owners to give me some sense of what the ownership structure is of some of those other abutting properties. Yeah, so down, uh, let me start from Chesterfield Road North. So down here, it's owned by Northampton DPW um, as part of our permanently protected water supply. This is emergency water only. This property over here where my cursor is, that's privately owned. I don't frankly know the relationship, but it's, you know, Sarafin and Clapp families were among the, I mean, the names may be different, but families date back to the original settlement of Northampton in the 17th century. Um, so this is still privately owned by one of the descendants. We hold a conservation restriction. So this land's preserved forever, but the city has a, a preservation restriction, so it can't be developed. Again, there's the old county road that follows the stream, so we have a right of way through that. We purchased this, all this land to the west. These are privately developed home lots. They all have homes. Some are very small, some are very large. So where my cursor is, that's a house here. So one house in this entire parcel. But so basically this is all homes here. Um, and then this land is back land. Like we made an offer once to the, the back side of this property and didn't come through, but you know, we keep working our way north to West Hampton Wine. I don't remember Linda the names offhand, but they're all privately owned, mostly associated with people who own homes along the road. Um, West Hampton, I don't know at all, but the story is similar that Division of uh, Fisheries and Wildlife is trying to connect these parcels together. Kestrel Land Trust has been our partner, has helped broker these deals. So Kestrel brought us into this because they were doing the rest of it. So we hope more and more of this land gets protected. Thanks, that's helpful. Uh, Wayne, can you, the, the third parcel you talked about, the carve out of the, of the owner's current home. Yep. Uh, how, how will that work? Will the city sell that parcel? How? No, so he's gonna keep it. So our, so we have a burden in this process. You know, if you fund us, we have to go through the permit process for him to make sure his house is, so he has an existing home there. Um, we have to make sure that that home is a legal home once he transfers the property. So there's a step we have to go through a special permit we get. We don't anticipate that being particularly difficult, but it's why this property has some soft costs because we have to go through the permit process. So existing home I'm pointing to with my cursor right here, is a well behind the home, he's an outbuilding here. So outbuilding home and well, and then back land around it. Um, we try to keep the bad, he was actually willing to sell us more land. We try to keep our boundaries far enough along, far enough away that we don't have to worry about trees falling over onto his house. Our biggest single conservation area maintenance cost, I think this is climate change, because it's gone up dramatically in the last few years, has been removing trees that lean over property boundaries. So we're trying to, to minimize that cost when we can. So he'll own this. It was important to us to own some frontage on the road to provide more means of access property. So you know, we already own this, we would get this. Very close to this is the back way on, on this map over here where my cursor is. There's an old gravel road that we have an easement in. And Somewhere over here, we have another east, and I can't remember exactly where it was. So we're looking at ways to, to connect those things together. And, and how do people access that, the, the existing trails? And, and you said the, the, the one that's going to cut across is the best trail on. Yeah. Current, so, uh, where is the access point for that? For so this green we already own. If, you're, if you drive down... Um, Ryan Road, just before you get to Sylvester Road, before you get to Jim's Variety Store, 
there's an old gravel road here. Right. So when we bought this property at a house, we had that house torn down. It was like a condition we made the seller tear it down. Um, but there's the old driveway that goes in. And we kept the first 100 feet of the driveway open for cars to park. And then That's we right. put big rocks so you can't drive the rest. Of it. So people can come in and park here. And then this, they can walk back here in trails. And there is an informal trail, which we don't maintain because we'll be trespassing, which cuts through this property. So there's already public access here and parking, already a trail here. What we would be adding is a new trail. I'm switching this other map, a new trail to bring us down to Ryan Road. And then if you wanted to allow you to cross the street with just a little bit of road walking to get to Parsons Brook. Great, thank you. Other questions for Wayne about these three open space acquisitions? Um, this is jumping ahead a little bit, Wayne, but uh, are you planning something in store for us in this spring? You know, it's a good question. I mean, always. <laughs> um, we have offers on the table for several parcels. And frankly, we have no idea which of those are gonna come through. So as of today, no. And, you know, I've been, this one, for example, we, for, we bought this land around here maybe a decade ago. And at the time we approached this owner to see if he wanted to sell. And he said, no. And, you know, there's a lot of people I sort of contact once a year and they say no until they say yes. So we have a few of those people on our list. It's just, it's really hard to predict. One thing that we're doing for both you all and the housing partnership is putting together a memo on all the affordable housing projects, so totally different area of our activity. The city has sort of stepped up our game and has gotten very active at um, finding land and permitting it and then transfer it on to affordable housing developers. We're working on, I think, eight different parcels right now. Um, like for example, tomorrow night, we go before city council to have them surplus land in the rear of the city hall parking lot going down to the roundhouse building, which we hope eventually becomes 20 to 24 studio apartments for the lowest end housing in the city. Um, so we're gonna send you a memo in the near future so you sort of see all those projects. Those are, you know, bigger, the nature of affordable housing, you can guess is you get nothing in a round or you get Valley CDC's first time home buyer, but nothing big. And then at some point we come before you or Valley comes before you or someone else for a million or $2 million for a big housing project. So we wanted to ask you sort of a sense of what's likely to come down the pike. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Wayne about the open space? Okay, moving on to the Connecticut River Greenway accessible walkway. All right, so next two projects have something in common, which is we're trying to both get more recreation and conservation and recreation commission properties and continue to expand um, what's accessible. Uh, so, so we're not required by law to make everything accessible. Um, some places it works more than others, the Mineral Hills and Salma Hills, for example, the slopes are so steep, it's difficult to do, but we have some properties where we could do this. So the Selma Hills is the first, uh, the, the uh, Connecticut River Greenway is the first one. You all were very involved when we did this big, so this is the Elwell unit of the Connecticut River Greenway, which we've owned. It was the second conservation area the city ever bought 30 years or 40 years ago. Um, but more recently we purchased another section of conservation area here and a section of parkland recreation area here the land was donated to us, so there was no money for the purchase, but CPA, as well as a large state grants and a large federal grant paid for the improvement cost. So we have this, we have a boathouse here, which is privately owned, um, and we have the, the uh, recreation area. Hurricane Irene, and then the movement of sand after Hurricane Irene, did a couple of bad things. They damaged the docks and made the area shallower. So this area had been part of the New Haven and Northampton Canal. So we know that for 150 years, there was this deep basin here that wasn't really filling up. And then Irene changed that, and did a lot of damage to um, well, both the shoreline, this railing got damaged, 
to the docks and it deposits a, a large sand beach. Um, we're interested in doing two things, helping Northampton Community Rowing rebuild their docks. They have a price quote for $47,000. Um, we wanna work with them so that's available not just for rowers, but for other people. And we'd like to expand their docks to serve the beach. Um, we had Bob Newton, who's a geomorphologist, I think is the term, at Smith College. He's sort of one of the experts in this area to do some work, to do underground mapping, uh, you know, basically underground contours, understand how the sandbar came to be and what its future is. And Bob, who's an expert, I don't claim to be an expert, said, we don't really know what the future will bring. That island, that sandbar could grow or it could shrink. Um, we've certainly seen this at Ella Island. Ella Island grew for about a century. And then that same storm wiped out some of the beach that had been growing. So, but on the whole, Ella Island is still growing. We expect in some form or others will be here. Even frankly, if it totally washes away, the old beach, well, not nearly as nice. It was silty instead of sandy. So people like me who are wimpy swimmers wouldn't like it because you have to tread water the whole time. The bottom is very silty and yucky, but it was still used. I mean, people used it for fishing, people used it for swimming. Now it's sandy beach, so it's used a lot. So we'd like to extend access to that area. So that's what the project is about. Uh, it's getting to, well, both rebuilding the docks and then extending the docks to the beach. We're in discussion with Northampton Community Rowing. So I can't tell you anything definite now, but the discussion we had with them is cities do a good job of capital improvements. We often don't have money for maintenance and it's particularly true in recessions when people get laid off or now where DPW has lots of money, but they can't find staff. So they have like 12 vacant positions. So we had a discussion with them as what if we could come up with a capital cost of the docks and then you did the work of pulling them in every, every fall and putting them out in the spring and did that maintenance work. And they're intrigued. I have a site visit them on Sunday, so no commitments. But that's what we're hoping is we can do something with them for the process. We just received a $50,000 grant from Mass Trails for an Northampton canoe trail or to improve the existing canoe trail. That money is going towards redoing some of the um, channel markers in the river that got destroyed in this summer's high water, adding um, no wake buoys, so we get less erosion at this beach and at the piers, and helping do this project. So we have 50,000. We don't have great prices yet, but our rough figure is 37,000. 30,000 will go towards the docks. Again, we need to get a sense of what the, the channel markers part will cost. So in answer to your usual question, is this a hurry? The general answer is no, except we would rather not do one project with the mass trails money and then come back and expand it. We'd like to do it all at once. So let me, do you, again, Brian, you wanna talk about this one now or should I go on to the next one? Uh, sorry, uh, questions for Wayne about uh, the Connecticut River Greenway project. Um, the, so when I was there the other day, there is a trail that goes as you're going down, I think to the end of the of the accessible walkway, there's the beach trail that goes off uh, sort of an informal trail that goes off to the right. Uh, that beach trail will remain informal. Is that correct? There's going to be no work on, on that. This project is simply adding to the infrastructure at the, at the end of the, of the trail. Is that correct? At this point, yes. That informal trail, I, I assume you can see my cursor. That informal trail, so this is the old, this is an old stream, and then it became the canal. Um, that informal trail cuts through crosses at the only culvert. So it's a great spot to cross over. So not accessible for crosses over and then cuts across River Run's property. So we can't really go that route. And it would, has a lot of great challenges. We couldn't go that route unless we could acquire the property. And even if we did that, it would be very difficult to make it accessible. So we would love to improve that trail, but again, property ownership first. We approached River Run a few years ago, you see this over here, 
and said, you know, it's your residents who are the biggest, who potentially are the biggest users of this area. Can we build a trail right to your building? And we had a lot of residents who really supported it. Most of the residents are renters. The trustees did not. They were very worried about homeless individuals coming in the back door and stealing from people's porches. So they wouldn't give us permission. But it's still, it's a sort of a standing offer on the table. So we hope we can go that way, Brian, but that's not what we're talking about now. That'd be a separate project. Now it's crossing down here where it's flat. The area down here has a challenge of whatever we do, we have to be able to take out during the winter and take out during really high river levels. And even though the river is highest in the spring, it can be higher, high any time of the year, but at least you have no, if the grade is perfectly flat. So this area is a big grade challenge. This area is a high water challenge. Other questions for Wayne? I'll take the liberty of asking one more. So this, this area is a really heavily uh, motorized zone. You've got uh, lots of boats whipping around that corner. Um, is, is there concern about opening it up even more to swimmers with the high volume of jet ski, motorboat, alcohol, um, folks, folks driving very fast and, and uh, sometimes almost blind around that corner? So yes. So I guess there's a couple answers. One is it's already started being heavily used. So we're trying to acknowledge the fact that people are using it anyway. Can we accommodate that? The second is, again, it's one of the reasons we don't know our exact budget from our state grant. We do want to put no wake buoys in that most dangerous area. So we'd like to, you know, we're fine for people being in the middle of the river, but we'd like the people very close to the beach to be going either not at all in that area or going a lot slower for exactly the reason you said. If you're ever on the Northampton community rowing docks when a boat goes through, it's pretty scary. The, the waves just throw that dock. I have a video somewhere I can show you whoever want, but the docks, it, the wake throws those docks up and down. So yes, it's absolutely a problem. And we think we can just keep people at some distance. Thank you. Linda? Uh, Wayne, I've stayed off of Damon Road now for some time, given the construction there. So could you remind me, I recall that before it was very hard to really tell where the access road was to get down there. Could you remind me what's there and tell me how adequate you think that is? Yeah, so it's getting better. So as part of that state project, the state is building an eight foot wide shared bike path and walkway from where the current State Mass Central Trail crosses Damon Road all the way up to opposite the river on entrance. So on this thing right over here, so this is Mock's liquor store over here and Mock's self-storage. That's the access to river on. So the state's eight foot wide path is gonna come right up to that intersection. And there's gonna be a signal there. It's pedestrian actuated only. So it's not gonna help cars, but there'll be a signal to get pedestrians across the street. And there will be sidewalks that go all the way out to King Street where, and there will be um, pedestrian signals. So if you're coming, this is the, the highest concentration of poverty in the city. So between River Run and um, Hampshire Heights, um, you know, a, a large low and moderate population. So from a pedestrian standpoint, the state is doing that. We offered River Run to build a sidewalk 10 years ago when we developed this area and they turned us down. They just approached us recently and said, okay, now we're ready for it. And so we're in discussions, what, what does that mean? And what kind of easements are there? So we're trying to improve the access. The consultants who we hired this year with CPA assistance to do analysis of all the informal swimming areas, part of their package is a wayfinding package. There is a sign right here, but it's pretty hidden. So one of the things they want to do is improve wayfinding and, and they have some really good suggestions for us in the process. And would it be possible to add that as a requirement? Because I think it is sort of a well-kept secret <laughs> as to how to get there. Um, having wayfinding as a requirement would be totally fine with us. We would like not to commit to exactly their package because we really haven't analyzed this. So having some kind of wayfinding, 
If you happen to go on the river on entrance, you see, because we wanted to improve pedestrian access, the first 80 feet is city owned. And we did put a sidewalk there with block grant money about six years ago. So that parcel of land is where we could put a wayfinding sign. So as long as that works, yes, we're ha we'd be happy to commit to that. Thank you. Any other questions for Wayne about the Connecticut River Greenway project? Okay, moving on to the uh, Rocky Hill Trail project. All right, so last project, um, this is, you know, Rocky Hill Greenway is a conservation area we own that's on both sides of Route 66. It basically surrounds the ice pond development and, you see, and we've been assembling land for a number of years on this chart the area in light green is the existing rocky hill greenway nearby the area in dark green is the former pine grove golf course which we purchased with cpa assistance about 18 months ago 16 months ago so february of 2020 um, we've been doing a lot of work we had a state municipal vulnerability program to restore natural hydrological and biological function um, of the golf course. Um, as part of the work, we planned a master trail network. Um, so on this chart, the dark, the solid white is existing trails. The dashed lines are either existing trails that exist only when we mow the field or we plan to have it. This long trail here, we actually just built recently. So that's actually an existing trail. This green is a very old road and we are in for state and federal funds for 2025 to build a bike path there. The current federal transportation program or transportation bill, which is stuck in Congress, but we're hopeful, has $360,000 for the city to build this. I'm sorry, um, 3.6 million for us to build this. Is that right? I'm sorry, here in the dollar map, <laughs> um, but money to build this trail. So we hope this will be a paved trail at some point. We have had this it, it, interesting outreach for the last couple of years of people saying they'd like what they're calling universal access trail. Technically, Northampton is more universal access trail than almost anybody else because we have 12 miles of bike paths, which is accessible. Um, so we have a lot of accessible trails that cross conservation and recreation and other properties. And they're great for some populations and they're, they're really the most accessible trails because they work great with you know whatever wheelchair is. And if you're blind, your cane feels the edge of it, but they're not always a wilderness experience. So we've had more requests to think about, can we get more soft surface trails? This thing on the graph is from somewhere totally different um, on the left side, but it's the sort of soft surface trail you start seeing popping up, right? It's solid enough surface for a wheelchair, but it feels, less intrusive than pavement does. So we're interested in doing more of this. We are currently doing a pilot program of about a thousand feet in this area where my cursor is to test different materials for this. Some materials are very high maintenance and that wouldn't really work. Some are really hideous like pavement and that wouldn't really work. So we're looking for something that wouldn't be like this one on the left, but something halfway between this and just having trap rock gravel. And that, that's our pilot. What we're asking for assistance from is to expand that loop, to have more. This, the, the golf course, you know, it has slope, is much flatter than most of our backcountry areas. So it's an area we could do a lot of trails that are below 5% or in some cases below 8%, either which meets ADA standards. So that's what we're looking for, um, is being able to do more trails through here. In particular, if we're doing this one, we'd love to do it send people back up to this area, sort of a, a lovely area back over here. Um, some of it, this area is actually pretty steep, so it probably wouldn't be. So, um, so that's really the idea is to keep expanding the space. And like the other one, we also have a Mass Trails grant for this from a previous cycle. The Mass Trails grant is about our Northampton One project. Um, if you remember, you gave us a small grant just as a pilot project for signage a couple of years ago. Um, this lets us expand that. You can see this is beginning to link all these things together. So we're 
currently working with the National Park Service, for example, to see could we someday extend the New England Scenic Trail, which now comes up down Mount Tom and then you just swim across the Connecticut River and goes up the Holyoke Range, we'd love, in fact, to go through Northampton and, and Hadley. So, you know, that may or may not happen, but the idea is how we build trails that are accessible and trails that connect together. Thank you, Wayne. Questions for Wayne about the uh, Rocky Hill Trail project? Linda? I got the impression from your application that you actually knew the material you were going to use, but it sounds like you're not so the the geo blocks or whatever, but it's so we know so, the generic. So geo cells the generic. So we know it'll be a geo cell type. So there are two types of geo cells. The one I showed you in the picture, which is as expensive as asphalt. Um, and so, you know, very expensive material and difficult labor. There are other kinds of geo cells that the plastic doesn't come up quite as high. So it nests, it holds the, the gravel, but then the gravel goes on top of it. So we have a general sense of what it is, but no, we don't have a brand name yet for, for what it is. So we're looking and comparing projects between them. Um, Mass Autobahns use these. That picture happened to be in Iceland. Um, uh, Mass Autobahn uses it on the Cape. So we're, we have an intern now who's sort of so we, we know in the general area, Linda, but we have an intern who's sort of calling around and saying, what's your experience been with this brand and the different approaches? Other questions for Wayne? Uh, this trail, this, the trail would be less than a mile, right? I think it was 0. 0.7 that you had in mind. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh -huh. um, and back to the maintenance issues, accessible trails are, are wonderful as long as they continue to be maintained. What, what is the, uh, with the geo cells, uh, how much maintenance do they require? Do they get rivets? Do they, I mean, how, how, uh, how does that work for maintaining those? So there's a couple of, so you always, I mean, everything's going to be maintenance. It is going to be higher maintenance than asphalt where basically we don't do much in asphalt till it fails, now we have to address it. Um, the golf course right now, obviously this could change, but it's an area that's attracted a lot of volunteers. So a lot of those trails are done by volunteers who are mowing them. One, one volunteer is a riding mower, others have used hand equipment. So assuming that level of effort is there, we could do it with volunteer. I mean, buying a little bit of gravel as that erodes away, we could easily do that. It's not a big ticket item. So getting volunteers, we don't think is any more work than the current volunteers. If we lost those volunteers, we would have to do it. It's a steady maintenance. So it's not a lot of maintenance, but you have to look at every single year, you have to look at you know, what were the frosties during the winter and how do, how do you address those things? Great, thank you. Any other questions for Wayne about either any of these three projects? So Wayne, remember the 3rd of November is when the public input happens for our committee. So welcome to uh, put notice out about that and encourage folks to come and voice their uh, feelings about these three projects. Sounds great. Uh, okay. we, are we good with Wayne? As always, thank you for your work. Thank you and for having me. This is great. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Good night. Thanks, Wayne. So last but certainly not least, we have the mortgage subsidy program from Valley uh, CDC. Uh, and the number of people are out from that project. Uh, Donna, I don't know if you wanna begin or? Sure. Good evening, folks. Nice to meet you all tonight. Um, this is my first time coming before the CPA committee. We've uh, worked with the CDBG program for a number of years. Well, as long as I've been here for the past nine years, and I, I believe probably 20 years prior to that. So thank you for having us tonight. I know you've read the proposal, and this is a mortgage subsidy program for first-time home buyers at or below 100% of the area median income. 
as you folks know, the last year and a half due to COVID, this housing market has been completely insane. And the first time home buyers that are below 120% AMI are getting really beat up out here. And, um, you know, they really need some help to try to purchase homes. And we do want to keep a diverse community in Northampton and, you know, try to make paths to help people obtain home ownership in Northampton who are below 100% of the area median income. So we would offer, you know, we would offer these subsidies. It would involve marketing. It would involve marketing the program, working with the clients to become eligible for the program, walking them through the steps of the process, of the application process. Many buyers are not going to be ready immediately. They might need some help to get themselves there. You know, what kind of loans do I qualify for? We will answer hundreds of phone calls. As soon as we put this out there, the next day the phone will ring all day. We'll answer hundreds of phone calls from real estate agents, bankers, attorneys, um, clients who are interested in the program would like to take advantage of the program about the process of obtaining the funds and the guidelines for the funding. So it, you know, it is a staff intense um, program. There's, you know, a, a, a lot of, um, you know, it's just a lot of staff work. It's a lot of talking to people and marketing, social media posts, helping folks understand the guidelines, helping them to figure out how they could fit within the guidelines. Like for instance, if their debt to income was too high, um, we can give them tips on how they could reduce that debt in order to qualify for the program. Um, so, you know, we, we, do ha we do have some recapture in this program. I have seen cities and towns in recent years would like some of their funds back when they see the property prices go up 30% year over year, which has happened in the last two years in Northampton. Let's hope uh, it's only around five or 6% in the year coming, um, more back to normal. Um, you know, so, so cities and towns like to see some of their funds back. And this is feedback that we have gotten from many cities and towns and talking to program staff in the planning and sustainability office. So we did put some interest and recapture into this program so that the city would recuperate some of these dollars back to the CPA. Um, you know, a mortgage and note would be drafted for this program and we could absolutely put in that mortgage and note that the funds would be returned to the community preservation, um, you know, funds. And, um, you know, we are working with folks who are purchasing. The unfortunate thing is they're using every last dime they have to get into the house and they're buying houses that need repairs and now they don't have any money remaining to make those repairs. And nobody's gonna loan them any money for, you know, until they pay that loan down below 80% loan to value. Um, you know, this is one of the pitfalls of home ownership for lower income households. So, um, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know we did send quite a few questions back, um, back to the committee. And, um, you know, we, I'm happy to answer any further questions about the program. Valley has been doing this work for a number of years. Linda. Hi, Linda. Hey, Donna. Um, I, do, I have a couple, a couple of questions. Uh, but but first, a statement. I I uh, know how intensive these programs are, and I I know the level of work that you put into working with the, the potential homeowners. So speaking just for myself, I don't question for a, for a second that you need those administrative dollars to do the kind of intensive work that I that I know you do. Um, but I I and you answered this next question partially in your presentation, but I know you know all of these mortgage subsidy programs backwards and forwards. So this was your opportunity to design one. Um, so I'm, 
interested in why you decided not to do, I'm sorry, I, I have to excuse myself. It's, so, so you're I, probably wondering I'll, why we don't. I'll come, I'll come back in a okay. second, but I, I just have to take this. I'm very sorry. I'll just say historically that Valley has has forgiven these loans over periods of time. This is going to be our first uh, program with a recapture. But, you know, cities and towns really want some of their money back because they're seeing the property values go up and up and up. And why shouldn't they get some of their funding back when when the value is there? The person is buying the house for 200000 They're getting a mortgage subsidy for 50000 The house is still worth 200000 so the you know the value is there the equity is there in the house to recapture go ahead with your question linda sorry about that I'm, i i and i apologize and i didn't hear what you just said so you that's may okay. have answered my question <laughs> that's okay we'll uh, my, answer my, your question. My, my question was some of some of the uh, subsidy programs um really try to preserve the particular house as affordable in the future mm. um by limiting the the resale price so and there's pros and cons on that it it takes away from the homeowner one of the benefits of home ownership which is uh, the ability to realize the equity on the other hand it preserves the unit is affordable and it's not just kind of a one-off so i wondered what your what your thinking thoughts were on that. So we definitely thought about that and we had really grave concerns with the HUD incomes because, you know, they've gone down. And if we if we sold the house this year um, with reduced incomes due to COVID, and then that person had to resell that property at 70% of the area median income, mm -hmm. what if they had to sell it next year and HUD plummets these incomes next year again? Due to COVID, can the person actually afford the house um, that's making 70% of the area median income or whatever we decided? Maybe it would be 80 or 85% that we would set the price at. The HUD incomes are so unpredictable. Honestly, HUD needs to modernize and look at people below 120% of the area median income as people who need help. Our, our, are the people that reached out to us in the past year were at 120 below, not just folks below 180 that needed help. More people needed help than ever. So, you know, I, I fear I don't have I fear that HUD will continue to reduce these incomes. You know, we're in it. We're in a large geographic area and we have a lot of service workers. We have a lot of people working part time and that all factors into the HUD numbers. And, you know, usually it's tied to those HUD numbers, the resale price of the property and the equity of the buyer. We do want the buyer, you know, we'd rather have the city get some of their money back and the buyer create some equity for themselves to maybe buy a bigger and better house. They might start yeah. off with a little three bedroom ranch on Florence Road or Ryan Road neighborhoods. Hopefully, you know, as their family grows, they can buy a, um, you know, a larger home or, or, you know, or maybe something closer to the school or closer to the bike trail where they can ride their bike to work. And I have one, thank you. Um, I have one other question, which is uh, how, how do you envision it working if the homeowner needs to refinance for purposes of capital needs? Would, would this subordinate, would that be possible? And would this be subordinated to it? Um, we, we feel that it should be like if, if a homeowner mm -hmm. needed a roof and they didn't have the cash and the exactly. roof was 15,000, we wouldn't want to see that they have the bids for that roof, you know, and that they're only cashing out for the purpose of that roof and improving the property. Maybe it's, you know, maybe they're buying the, uh, dated, the dated 1980s, uh, you know, ranch and that needs a little remodeling and, you know, the, a new kitchen, new bathroom, things like that do improve value. So we would, I, you know, I would recommend that the city ask for those bids in writing and that they only allow folks to cash out for the amount of, of those bit, you know, of that work that's being done. So if it is for an improvement, yes, but for like paying off credit cards or paying for the right, kids right, college right. or anything else, no, the money should definitely be going right into the property. Okay. Thank you. And we would have time to design this with, you know, 
we would have time to work with the city to design you know these guidelines and you know if you want to refinance these are the only ways you can refinance thank you donna other questions for Don other questions for donna um let me see if i understand the whole uh, recapture uh, strategy sure. um so if if a uh, buyer was were to sell the house within 15 years that 50,000 um subsidy would be returned in its entirety plus, plus interest the, yeah plus the interest and that would come back to us us meaning cpc is that correct if if that's what the committee feels is appropriate, um, we could we could absolutely have the mortgage and note reflect that that the money goes back to the you know to CPA. Okay, and then at the end, and then between year sixteen and thirty, there is sort of a, a the the loan slides off, the subsidy slides off in terms of what they would pay back. Right, uh, but nonetheless, there there would still be payback up until year 30 is that correct yes and even at year 30 folks are going to owe some interest on that folks are going to owe seventy five hundred dollars of interest on the loan okay. even on year 30 when they're looking for a discharge of that mortgage they're going to need to pay seventy five hundred dollars to get that discharge and seventy five hundred would be the total after 30 years that they would pay yes. Yes. for that fifty thousand subsidy Yes. Uh, so the recapture really is between years one through 30. It's just interest. You know, it's in, well, if they, you know, they're going to pay some of it back if they see or sell at year 20. If they sold at year 20, they would be looking at paying back around, around 100 and around 40, around 40,000. I'm sorry, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but, but they're still going to be paying, they're still going to be paying something back. You know, it's forgiven at $3,333.33 each year through years 16 through 30. So okay. they, you know, if they sold at year 16, they're still going to, they're still going to owe, you know, 55000 on this loan. And, and again, th that money would come back to CPC. We could absolutely make the mortgage and note state that, that the money comes back to CPC. And and a question for Sarah is that appropriate to have the money come back to CPC that way? Is that? Yeah, I mean, if the CPC wanted to create a program where this funding would go back to the affordable housing fund and either be used for additional projects at that time or be used for additional first-time homebuyer programs, that's certainly something that can be done. It's not something that we've done before, um, but it, it's certainly allowable. And it doesn't create a financial uh, uh too much of a financial headache for you so not really um the burden of the the work with refinancing and addressing these loans will be done uh, by city staff uh, but we do al already have programs similar to this as part of community development block grant those details would have to be worked out but again that that's something that we can deal with and we're glad to have you refer folks over here to, you know, so that they prepare themselves to to make those requests with the city. You know, we can kind of run them through it and help them with their letters and tell them you need bids first. Don't even don't even ask until you have the bids, you know, things like that. Great. Thank you. Other questions for Valley Community Development? Are we All right, I'll go. Um, so I have so many questions, um, but I don't want to. I don't want to waste the committee's time educating me on all the things I don't know about housing acquisition. Um, I guess what I'm want to know is, uh, and and Sarah just helped a little bit. So this is this is. I mean, other people are doing similar things in Northampton and other people are doing similar things in other communities. Uh, so you have a model for this. Um, I'm assuming it's been successful. Um, uh, it doesn't seem like the kind of thing, and I'm not saying this is a, is a bad thing, but it it, it it feels different than the other types of programs that we're usually asked to fund, um, which are much more sort of concrete. 
um, it, at least in my mind. And I, uh, so I'm, I'm, these are just things that I've been thinking about um, because I'm, so that that's number one uh, is that, that this doesn't, it doesn't fit into the portfolio that, that I'm familiar with as far as CPC. Um, so I'm going to want, want to think about that some more. The second thing is, um, uh, I mean, this is a this is a one time program, uh, which is going to help for homeowner potential homeowners, and that'll be sort of the beginning and end of it as far as this this go round goes. But when programs like this are done in other communities, are they um, you know done in rounds or is it is it like this, where it's sort of a just a you know one-time grant for a select group of individuals, or is it something where uh, other communities, or even Northampton in, in other capacities, have established a um, you know uh, um, a system whereby uh, people it, it's an ongoing resource. Um, I guess what I'm getting at here is you know this is all well and good, but if it's only going to help four people um, in 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 Northampton, maybe we ought to be thinking a little bit bigger and 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 how how best to get at that. Um, and I forgot the last thing I was going to ask. But I'm sure uh, it's going to come back to me. Um, Chris, while, while you try and remember that, I can speak to the, the first question you raised about this being a little bit different than most of the housing projects that we've seen in Northampton. Yeah. Um, so most of I or almost all of what we've seen to date has been either acquisition of community housing or direct creation of community housing. Thank you. But this is a this is a <laughs> right. completely different CPA yeah. um, okay. funding category. So this is support of community housing, which is um, direct grants to um, people who are eligible yeah. for that housing. So that can include loans and rental assistance, security deposits, that, those types of things. So definitely different, um, but also allowable. And so okay. That, that yeah. Way. I'd just right. like to add to that, if you don't mind, Sarah. So we, our hope is that we're going to meet with about 45 or 50 folks. And yes, four of them will have the benefit, but maybe some of the other folks are not ready right now. But maybe we come back into CPA in two or three years and those folks have gotten themselves ready to be able to take advantage of this program or another program, you know, because they, they connect with us and they understand what we're doing and people do take positive steps towards meeting that goal of home ownership and improving you know, improving the quality of their life, improving their assets. And um, we have been doing a program with the CDB, with CDBG for more than 20 years. I think, I don't know, 30 years, 30 or some odd years where we have three and four. Some years we have three grants, some years we have four grants. Um, but we've been giving folks four thousand dollars for a number of years. Right. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's six, sometimes it's three. It just depends on how much funding there is for that for any given year. Um, the problem we run into is um, those are under HUD, regula HUD regulations and a lot of families with children do not apply because it's four thousand dollars. And the realtor tells them, oh, don't apply for that. You got to de-lead the property. You got to de-lead de the property. It's not worth it for the $4,000. You know, they kind of scare them out of it. The realtors kind of talk them out of, you know, applying for the funds. And, and folks are using their last dime to get in this house, honest to God. Um, you know, so we hope that we're preparing some folks to take advantage of these programs in the future, as well as the recipients that, you know, actually actually get themselves ready to take to um, move into home ownership during this 18 month period and take advantage of these funds it will not be easy for the buyers to win a bid it's still it's still it's coming down it's coming down out there there's not as many out of towners snapping up properties and overbidding and outbidding everybody but it's a challenge for buyers to actually buy. I'm, I'm working with a girl right now, and she's been out there for about two years uh, trying to purchase a home. And um, she's below 80%, and she's using every last dime. I look at the property, and it's, you know, hasn't been remodeled in a long time. It's a solid house, but, you know, uh, they have no assets left at the end of the day to make those repairs and upgrade those properties that would increase the property value and, you know, the the taxability of that asset, you know, of that particular property, you know, uh, we do want people to take care of these homes and, and improve them as well.
and that is part of our education you know we do we do require that folks take post purchase education learn about maintaining the home learn about homeowners insurance learn about you know fixing little fixing things while they're small and not letting it get disastrous because i'm sure the city's aware of properties you know that are that really need a lot of work and and folks just don't don't uh do the work other questions for donna martha Thank you. I have two questions. Um, one is, I think, fairly hopefully simply answered, and the other is more of a philosophical question. Uh, the first one is, um, are you confident that there is stock available uh, out there for purchase in this category? Yes, I, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, unfortunately, that $250,000 ranch that Folks used to buy these were my clients buying the ranch houses in the Florence and Ryan Road area. That was the only place my buyers could afford or the condominiums on Damon Road. Those were like kind of two key places that um, my for folks could afford to buy. Um, unfortunately, these houses are now pushing 300,000. When I first started here nine years ago, you could still pick up one of those houses for 180,000. So, you know, it's pretty incredible what's happened over the last decade with housing. And yes, there are houses. I have a gal today, she's below 80% and this income threshold is a slightly higher. And she's purchasing, she's purchasing a house for 315,000. But her interest rate is 2.375 with the MHP one mortgage program. So that interest rate allows her a lot more house. And there are um, there are 46 homes and condos available between 250 and 350. Yeah, 250 is probably the lowest you can absolutely go and have it have me approve it because if it's below 250, it probably needs way too much work. And I'm going to be like, how are you going to fix all this stuff? You know, that's part of the process too is that we go out and view the property and we're going to talk to the buyers. How are you going to put this roof on? How are you going to how are you going to fix make these repairs mm -hmm. to this property? Um, when you spend every last dime you have and nobody wants to loan you any money until you pay that loan down below 80%. And these folks will even have a tougher time because they got the second mortgage. Um, you know, many banks, many banks are going to want them to pay that loan down before they're going to give them any equity to make those repairs to the property. So this is part of, part of our process that, you know, how will you deal with the repairs that the particular property needs? But right now, uh, things are calming down from the COVID out-of-towner um, kind of dynamic that we had over the last year. And I'm seeing price reductions, which I did not see, which I did not see. I, I watch the properties in East, I watch the properties in the towns that we serve. You know, I get the, I get the listings in my emails. The first thing I do every morning is look at the properties while I have my coffee. And, um, you know, I am seeing price reductions. I'm seeing more inventory come up. It's not popping off the market as quickly as it as it did um, earlier this year. So I do feel there are properties available for our buyers. Thank you. Um, the other question is just, a, um, again, more of a philosophical question. Um, do you think that there are programs like these, um, which you know, I think is terrific, um, actually end up propping up the housing market, you know, fueling a, a more um, heated market, R you know, raising the price of housing, making more houses, or, yeah, more houses less affordable to more people. I I'm just, it's a, again, philosophical. I don't know the answer. So. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure how to approach that one. I know COVID certainly did that to the market. Um, that's for sure, because you know we had a lot of city dwellers who wanted to come out to Western Mass, and you know it wasn't just people from Boston; they were from Chicago and New York, and you know Florida, Florida. Who yeah. who would know that Floridians were all coming back to Massachusetts? Um, yeah, that's a really tough question. Um, it's similar to the college loans. I think that you know there's a philosophy that because there was so much money loaned for college that it allowed college to become really expensive. Right. It's the same. Yeah. A car right. Yeah. Yeah. We do. We do worry about it. Northampton was pretty unscathed in the last housing crisis. Um, 
you know, they did not see the depreciation in values like the larger cities of Holyoke, Chickamby, and Springfield, you know, because <clears throat> they just were unscathed. People want to live here. You know, you got, you're got you in a large college area. People want to live here. There's a lot of people trying to come to this area who would like to live here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Other questions yeah. for Donna? Um, forgive me if you if you uh, put this out there already. How did the fifty thousand limit come up? You talked about a lot of four thousand dollar loans. How, why fifty thousand? Well, we looked at you know we looked at different household sizes and you know we looked at the we looked at the pricing of houses and what the needs of those households would be, and you know for a family of four to buy a house, moving condition without them using every last dime that they have we felt fifty thousand was a was a good number um you know we we ran some scenarios we did provide we did provide those in our initial um in our initial meetings with the housing committee and uh you know uh people felt it was um felt felt it would be a workable number uh Thank brian if, if i could speak to that as well I, I up on the interim executive director at Valley CDC. Please. Um, I'm uh, there since June. And um, I, I, I was, I think also this can address uh, Chris's, some of Chris's questions. Um, if you think about the kind of scale, I think Chris was talking a little bit about scale um, of projects. And if, if a community preservation committee recommends a million dollars for an affordable housing project, and you know, the the uh, municipality might choose to bond that, and if that if that uh, if that project produces twenty units of affordable housing, that actually ends up being around fifty thousand dollars per unit of a subsidy, and those are the kind of numbers that we would see. I chaired the I chaired the Community Preservation Act Committee in Amherst for about six years, and those were the kind of projects that we saw a fair amount of. So I think in terms of um, and we and we also we also saw more good subsidy um, proposals come to us, which we we also did approve in um, in Amherst. And I, so I think if you think about it in kind of terms of the scale, it's just that it's a different um, those those affordable housing projects typically are rental, and what this project is doing is getting um, low and moderate income people into an ownership um, into an ownership situation, which actually can have the ability to help stabilize a neighborhood. And also provide for the possibility of a greater, perhaps greater diversity um, in the neighborhood, uh, economic diversity at least, since people who are previously perhaps shut out of the market. So I think that um, on, on the scale of things, while it seems like a lot of money, in fact, proportionate to some other projects that um, that Community Preservation Act money has supported, it's 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 relatively speaking could be in the range. Um, could be in the range of, of uh, how CPA money has been used previously. So, um, and I can also I can also say we've done an analysis of the of the mortgage subsidy programs that we've done in uh, East Hampton and Amherst and Pelham, and we've analyzed the staff time. And um, it, it, as Linda as Linda pointed out uh, previously, I think we are we are in. We're at, we're at a point where it's pretty much between seven and nine thousand dollars per mortgage subsidy, regardless of the size of the subsidy. So I think Donna's point is that um, in this market, um, fifty thousand dollars is actually the kind of money that we need to be able to get four families into uh, four families who otherwise are shut out of the market uh, into home ownership. So um, we appreciate your consideration of this. Yeah, or they're buying houses that are complete fixer uppers, and those can be really, really trying on folks. And and honestly, you know, some of those houses are the folks that really, you know, kind of fall off the cliff, you know, and end up end up in a financial situation because the repairs are greater than their affordability. Thank you. Any other questions for Peter and Donna? Linda? Uh, you mentioned diversity, and I think that is uh, in, in encouraging, hopefully increasing diversity, uh, which I think could be a very useful byproduct of this. 
but how, how do you, um, since, since Northampton is not particularly diverse, current residents who might uh, hear of and, and be interested in this are not gonna increase the diversity. So wh what do you do to, for your outreach to encourage a more diverse applicant pool? The, the subsidy would be, would be, we would put this out there to all the housing agencies you know, across Western Mass, even into Worcester County, you know, we want to try to, we want to try and encourage other folks who don't actually live here to apply for these, to apply for these subsidies. So, you know, we have a mailing list of a lot of agencies that we reach out to, um, you know, and I'm going to talk to housing counselors. I'm not just going to send them an email. I'm going to actually talk to them and say, hey, can you, can you talk about this in your class? And I, I know people all over the area. And I'm hoping that they'll do that and they'll add me to their PowerPoint slide and say, hey, call Donna Cabana. You know, so we're going to be talking about this in Springfield and Holyoke and Chicopee and all the area housing housing um, organizations. You know, I know staff and most of them. And, um, you know, that's kind of how we do it, just by word of mouth. And, you know, we're going to have past clients that we know are within the income guidelines. And we know those demographics that we can send email blasts to to try to encourage those folks to apply for this program. Thanks, Donna. All things being equal, if two, if two clients uh, are after the same subsidy, how do you decide, or three or four or five clients? And I assume there's gonna be a lot more interest in that there'd be a much larger pool than four families. How do you ultimately choose? Generally, we run these programs first come, first serve with the sign purchase and sale. I'm encourage, encouraging people need to meet with me ahead of time to go over the guidelines before they're even bidding on properties so that they understand the debt to income guidelines and where their mortgage payment has to be, where their debt level has to be, because they're, you know, we're not just going to, we're not just going to take any mortgage from any mortgage company. It has to be long-term sustainable. We don't want to set anybody up in a position where they're not going to be able to pay their bills because they own this house and there's repairs that need to be made. Thank you. Any other questions? So Donna and Peter, as we've said before, uh, November 3rd is the chance for uh, folks to weigh in at seven o'clock uh, on Zoom. So we encourage you to get the word out to your clients or prospective clients uh, regarding your, your program. Uh, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you so coming. much for having us. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate it. So we have uh, five, is it, or six more projects, five, uh, that we will be entertaining again, not two weeks from now, but next Wednesday, 27th. Um, so, uh, is there any other business not foreseen when this agenda was published? Anything else to talk about? Hi, Brian. Dan here. Sorry for running behind this evening and I'm happy to support the, the minutes if they came up earlier for, oh, for good. I reviewed those and thank you, Dan. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's good to see your face again. Sometimes it's just the screen, so it's nice to see faces. Uh, any anything else out there? Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Sure, I'll move to adjourn. And a second. Yeah, I'll second. Julia. Great. I don't think we need to vote on that, right, Sarah? No, not on that. Um, so thank you all, and we will see you in one week. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.